Hello, everybody. Welcome and good evening. I am absolutely delighted to be joining you tonight and uh, so delighted that I've also invited my fellow colleague Catherine along for the ride. So good evening members, good evening Catherine from the tastings team and most importantly good evening Tom Barnes from home by Simon Rogan. Hello Tom. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I was lucky enough to try this menu to pair the wines months ago now um, but I think it's a really fitting cool evening for something warming and delicious so hopefully members you're up to uh, up to scratch with your warm bread and you're ready to kick off for those of you joining on YouTube as well I hope that you've got everything ready to start the session please don't worry because we're going to guide you through we're going to tell you what to prepare and when and hopefully you've all received the PDF instructions and you have the instructions in your meal kits sent as well by the lovely Brooke who helps organize this event, who is behind the scenes. So hello, Brooke. Um, I'm gonna kick off in, a in just a moment, but uh, just to give you a little idea about how the event's gonna work before I introduce Tom and pour myself a glass of champagne. I'm gonna talk about the wines this evening. We've got Tom who is obviously going to talk about the food and there is no one better place. I'll explain why in a minute. And then lucky Catherine is sort of our ultimate guinea pig this evening because Catherine is going to live and breathe the event with you. She's gonna have the wine and prepare the food alongside you members. And that means that she will be the one that's, I'm gonna suggest why I chose the wines, but Catherine's gonna be putting me to the test and telling me whether my suggestions were good ones or not. So uh, Catherine, you've probably got the best job tonight, right? <laughs> nodding furiously as she eats her bread there we go I think that says it all <laughs> so members if you haven't already please do pour your pour yourselves a glass of champagne and I would love to introduce Tom so to give some background on Tom he has the most ridiculously celebrated and successful career he started cooking I think 14 years old is that right Tom uh, yeah, yeah, about that, yeah. Yeah, um, and had worked at a string of restaurants. So he returned home to Cumbria, where he started working at Longclume in 2014, and then won the Roof Scholarship, which took him over to Belgium to work at uh, the Bon, uh, sorry, Hof van Cleve restaurant. Um, and he worked there for a year, continued in Longclume, which is obviously the Simon Rogan now three Michelin star restaurant, more on that in a sec. Um, but then Tom, I believe you also went back to Copenhagen to work at a three Michelin star restaurant, Geranium, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. So yeah, I've spent a bit of time abroad, uh, yeah. It's uh, Belgium, Copenhagen. Um, yeah, and I've been, well, I actually started for Simon in 2011, so... I've been 11? Working, yeah, so I've been working for him for about 12 years now, so... Amazing, and you came back, if I'm right, at, in 2018, uh, having done your, your time in, in Geranium, to work for Rogan & Co, and help them earn their first Michelin star in 2019. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah, so when I was in Copenhagen, Simon asked me to come back. Initially, it was only meant to be... To help him for a few months while he was looking for a new head chef of Rogan and Co. Uh, then we won uh, the Michelin star, and then not long after that, I got promoted to the role I'm <laughs> in now. So yeah. So for members that aren't aware, uh, Tom's role now is the executive chef across Simon's restaurants. So he has been not only monumental in Rogan & Co's first Michelin star, but also, as many of you will know, Long Clume won the third their third star last year so incredibly well deserved um and tom has been really um at the forefront i don't think that's what you say for chefs do you at the stove yeah, <laughs> at the <past>. cooker <laughs> yeah, yeah at the past there we go uh for all of this and many of you may also recognize tom because uh if like me you're currently addicted to great british menu uh you might recognize tom from the 2020 final where his award-winning main course was served up uh, a Peter Rabbit inspired, Beatrix Potter inspired main course. So you may recognize him from there as well, if you've not been lucky enough to eat at one of his restaurants. So Tom, thank you so much for joining us. And on a Friday night. Oh, no problem at all. I'm uh, excited to be here. <laughs> 
who did who did whose arm did we have to bend to get the executive chef to join the wine society members on a Friday night at some of the most celebrated restaurants in the UK? Uh, Brock. The Brock. Brock. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Brooke. I'm having a glass of champagne on you because I really, really appreciate it. Um, so I am going to quickly talk about. Uh, I'm going to quickly talk about the champagne. But before we start, I'll just let members know that you can use the chat like some of you already are, letting us know where you are, what you're drinking. Um, and then after that, we are going to have right at the end of the session, if you haven't already consumed too much wine, there will be some time for questions. But I recommend you put them into the Q&A, the question and answer box, because that way we can potentially ask them as we go along as well. So, um, in fact, I'm not going to talk about the champagne first. I've talked enough. I want to hear from Tom. Tom, would you tell everyone a little bit about the bread? And I'm going to enjoy a glass of champagne. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so the bread, um, we've got a beautiful uh, sourdough uh, bun. It, it's from a, a bakery in London, um, which is uh, called Capital Bread. So the baker's called Francois. And uh, we initially sort of started this relationship with him uh, during lockdown. He uh, knew one of the chefs that was working with us and he, he sort of reached out and told us that he obviously because of lockdown, he wasn't getting any work and he was sort of worried about his business. So we came up with a deal to he would do the bread for our at home uh, boxes. Um, and then uh, just the customers absolutely loved them. So, so we've carried on really. It's become uh, you know, a staple part of the, the boxes and it's uh, served with some uh, Wintertown butter, which is a local uh, dairy in Cumbria, so it's not too far from the restaurant, and uh, it's been whipped up, and then we season it with some uh, Malden sea salt. So it's uh, it's delicious when it's like coming fresh out of the oven with plenty of butter on it. It's, uh, it's really nice. Yeah, um, bread and butter is Catherine. I think you and I's <laughs> favorite snack. She's nodding. If there's ever an opportunity at an event, uh, Catherine and I think uh, right to the bread and butter. Yeah, and what do you think of this bread and butter combination? Well, Catherine? The first thing I would say is that it took everything in me not to inhale it immediately yesterday when my uh, pack arrived. I held off, I put it away um, and I looked forward to it all day and it is delicious. I mean, I really love the tang that you get with the sourdough and whipping butter just, oh, it just, it makes it so great, doesn't it? I think maybe it's because you're getting the air pockets in and then you're getting more surface area and more butter on your taste buds. It's just, it's delicious. So can't fault it. Good. Yeah. I always love, um, I've got a husband that loves bread and butter as well. And he always says that your meal kits are the best bread and butters in the biz, Tom. So oh, they <laughs> pass on the regards. Uh, so, oh, we've got some thumbs up as well. That's good. That's what we like to see. <laughs> so I think that means that I should probably share, bear with me. I'm just getting my laptop geared up and ready to go. It's not been on the champagne this evening. Uh, bear with me. So I'll quickly talk very briefly. Uh, well, not very briefly, but I hope that members are indulging in the combination. So I'll talk about the champagne. But I, uh, you might think, oh, I picked the Society Champagne because it's um, because it's the Society Champagne. But actually, I think you've got such a rich, delicious flavour in your bread, Tom, that it needed a rich wine to start with. So. Um, the society does the job of that it's not a, a wimpy champagne it's not a light champagne and um, it's produced by our longest ah oh, somebody's asked to show the bread Catherine do you have any left <laughs> she's gonna show oh sorry I've skipped too far Catherine I'll get Catherine on the full screen have you got some bread Catherine so it, it doesn't have a top anymore but oh, I imagine yeah, it had a lovely <laughs> rustic top but you can see the lovely gaps in there Oh, yeah. Lovely pockets of pockets of air there. <laughs> Sorry, Catherine, I put you on the spot. <laughs> um, hopefully that was uh Wedmore, that was what you what you desired. Uh so yes, this the reason I chose this particular champagne, you can see here it's fermented for a long time in old oak. And actually that adds this incredibly rich flavor. So I find that sort of sourdough yeasty flavors come um, come from this, but also that's quite classic of champagne, but also the oak aging gives it this real roundness. Um, so it is produced for us by Alpha Gracia. 
uh, based in Champagne, naturally. And we've been working with them since 1906. And it's I always forget this, 45% Chardonnay and then equal parts Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. So that's actually a relatively even split if you're comparing it to something like, let's say, Paul Roger, that's a third, a third, a third. So there's a, a higher proportion of Chardonnay, but some producers will have all Chardonnay, some all Pinot Noir. So you have got all three of the key grapes in there. And then as the, as the slide suggested, the base wine is fermented in these oak casks. They're old, they're bought from Chablis, they don't have any flavour adding, but they add this roundness and this richness that I mentioned. And when they ferment the, the base wine, after they put it in the bottle, as you do to produce sparkling wine, so they put their vin clair, their base wine, uh, which has been fermented in oak, into the bottle. And when they put the yeast in to make the bubbles, what they actually end up doing is leaving the, the yeast in there for even longer than other producers. So that adds that yeasty character. And for me, that's where you get this lovely goes with bread. Um, some, some wines, sparkling wines are built to go, you know, just with smoked salmon, for example, but this definitely has a, a, an extra component of richness. Um, the cellar master is Nikola Jaeger. Many of you will have met him, members who are, who are big uh, society fans. He's the fourth generation cellar master. He's a really, really lovely guy. Um, and he works in the cellars in Epanne. And if you haven't got this wine in front of you, and I know some of you don't, um, but if you haven't got it in front of you, the most similar for me personally is um, Krug. And that's because Krug also do this slightly unusual oak fermentation of the base wine. So um, I'd hate to say it's poor man's Krug because I don't think that you can call it a poor man's anything. It's such a good sparkling wine. But I do think that um, Krug is a good comparison if you wanted one. Um, and then for any real geeks out there, the base wine of this wine, I believe, is now on the 2017 vintage. Um, I'd have to check. And it does sort of depend on wh when you bought your wine because uh, it did move vintages quite recently um so it's 2017 base wine to my knowledge if you really want to geek out on it um Catherine what do you think you've tried this wine many times I have I, I didn't um crack open a bottle of the champagne this evening I thought I'd hold off they've got four to go for, for the food so I thought <laughs> I'd hold back but obviously it's a champagne we're very familiar with and I think I might just have to order loaves and loaves of sourdough and just have a sourdough and champagne supper one evening because yeah. I think you're right it's got that really really lovely sort of a tangy yeasty quality to it but also I think if you want to look at how the the butter pairs with the really fruity citrusy um quality of the champagne as well you've got that lovely creamy pairing it's um it's really nice so it's an, an all-rounder and Tom, when your um, champagne can be a bit of a funny one to food pair with, which is why obviously we did this as more of an introductory, um, you know, aperitif and as opposed to a full food pairing. But have you experimented with pairing champagne and 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 proper, you know, main courses before? Anything for you that's worked? Um, no, I couldn't tell you if I'm being totally honest. Um... No, not I can think of. I mean, I always think of champagne to be drunk, like you say, at the start of the meal. So, yeah. I've had one that blew my mind. Well, that's not true. I've had two. One one was me and one was a chef. So I had one chef who um, paired a, a Pinot Noir, so a, a, a sort of richer, slightly earthier, actually, version of a champagne with um, pork belly, which okay. was really nice. Um, and then I will be very honest with you. The other fantastic pairing, Catherine probably knows what I'm about to say, is chicken nuggets, <laughs> <laughs> which were incredible. Um, and I think fried chicken and sparkling wine in general, but fish and chips and sparkling wine is a really lovely match. So, um, yeah, Tom, if you've not tried those, then uh, that's <laughs> that would be yeah. my biggest recommendation. I'll get, I'll get on it. <laughs> there are worse things. Um, and do you have a fam favourite sparkling wine brand at all, Tom, or anybody that you... What Who's the go-to sparkling wines in the restaurant? Uh, well, we uh, have a partnership with uh, Exton Park. Oh. Simon does, so, yeah, I'll have to say that. He, am I right in thinking that Simon has a place near Exton Park, or did... Yeah, he? yeah, he's got... Yeah, he's got a house down south, yeah. 
Yeah, I seem to remember talking to him about it and he he was, you know, pals with them and went down there and had a lovely time. So for yeah. members who don't know, it's a fantastic sparkling wine from South of England. Um, probably not as rich as this, so not as dense, um, but an amazing aperitif style sparkling wine. So yum stuff. Right, so I'm conscious the last thing I want to do is get behind time because if we get behind time tonight then uh, things will go pear-shaped so members we are a couple of minutes ahead of schedule but I'm going to touch wood and, and not um, oh, not be too upset by being two minutes early what I would suggest is if you can return just before 7 35 that would be great so that will allow you enough time to pour your Chardonnay and to prepare your starter, which Tom, as soon as we get back, whilst it's beautifully piping hot, is going to talk you through. He's going to talk you through the ingredients and the concept of the dish um, and why it works. And Catherine, that gives you enough time to prepare yours as well. So uh, good luck, members. Bon courage. Um, I think it's uh, having done it myself. This is a lovely, lovely, simple, but simple for us to prepare definitely not simple for Tom's team to have prepared they've done all the hard work so it will take you uh, no longer than getting back here for 7 35 I promise promise so we'll see you then and in the meantime I will stay on the chat if you have any questions so see you all shortly
Hello, everyone. I'm joining a couple of minutes early, mainly because I wanted to show you Catherine's just sent me a photo of her meal. And I'm not sure whether you can see that. There we go. So Catherine, <laughs> we had a few we had a few members earlier asking to see the bread. I think you've done yourself justice. Is, is she plated well, Tom? Very nice. Yeah, very good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I must admit, these events, oh, they some of the most joy is all the little fiddly bits, but um, I don't think I could do more than one at a time. So I won't be looking for a job in a kitchen soon. <laughs> That's all right. We normally have a big team for the restaurants. So. <laughs> So uh, we're just uh, one minute off uh, kickoff, but I'm hoping, Catherine, you look like you also had your wine as well. So you're ready to go. Primed. I'm good to go. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, oh, look, there's people who are back ahead. So uh, it looks like um, it looks like we can probably kick off. Yes. So I can hand over to Tom, who's going to talk about this lovely dish. I have to say, Tom, just... Before you start, I mean, I am um, uh, the the soups, broths, everything that comes out of the Simon Rogan stable in a liquid form is like nectar to me. They are absolutely amazing. So I can't wait to hear about this dish and to hear all about the ingredients and also, yeah, how you created it. So over to you. Cool. Um, yeah. So um, basically, the the inspiration for the starter is is kind of a similar flavour to uh, like a French onion soup, uh, but then done in a different way. So the broth itself is made from uh, roasted Roscoff onions. So we, we roast the onions in the skin until they're really caramelised. And then we, uh, we sous vide them uh, with water. And then we just cook them in the water bath uh, overnight at around 80 degrees. So all the flavour from the onions ends up in the broth, uh, which then we season uh, with a, a dashi stock. So it has a, a lot of umami in it. Um, it's a little bit smoky. Um, and then to sort of intensify that onion flavour, we have a nice uh, caramelised onion puree, uh, which is in the little bag. So that's, uh, again, it's just to sort of enhance the onion flavour. And some pickled onions as well for uh, some nice acidity uh, to cut through the richness of the puree and the cheese. And then uh, the potato, uh, so the potatoes are grown on our farm. We uh, slice them very thinly. We uh, coat them in milk and then we bake them. And then once they're cooked, we, we press them uh, in a weight so they're, they're very compressed. And cut them into little uh, cubes so the idea is when you fry them they'll go nice and crispy and, and just add a lovely sort of texture to the dish and then uh, a lemon thyme oil which is again to sort of a little bit of acidity and it just adds a nice sort of rounded flavor to the whole dish brings it all together uh, the lemon thyme again grown on our farm um which is it's just a simple infusion uh, equal parts oil to lemon thyme and then we again in the water bath for around 80 degrees for about uh, six hours just to bring out the flavour, and then uh, we pass that off. And then the dish is just there finished with some um, cress, which is all grown on our farm, uh, adds a, a nice sort of herbal note to it. So it's a, it's a very sort of intensely flavoured dish, um, not overly rich uh, as a starter, but it's got a nice richness to it with the cheese. Um, and the idea is obviously as you pour the hot broth onto the cheese, it softens it slightly, and uh, yeah, you just have all the sort of textures and like layers of flavour to, to create a, a lovely starter, really. It is amazing. Um, I've got a couple of questions already on that description, if it's all right. Um, the lemon thyme and oil, is that something you could tr people could try at home? Yeah, definitely. If you don't have, um, if, like I'm sure not everybody has access to sous vide at home, but you could just do it, warm the oil. Uh, if you have a probe, ideally, you want to take it to around sort of 80 degrees just have it on a, a very low heat uh, like I say equal parts um, oil to the herb and then yeah just leave it on a low heat let it infuse uh, if you're doing it directly on a heat it wouldn't take quite as long as uh, as in the water bath so mm. you could just keep tasting it basically until you're happy with the the intensity of the oil but I'd say on the stove probably one to two hours yeah um I think that might be a little project for me how about you Catherine <laughs> Definitely, definitely. I think as well, the fact that it's lemon thyme and not just thyme, because it's that really lovely woody herb, but the citrusy lift just yeah, brings exactly. it all together. It's really delicious. Yeah. And you can do that technique with any sort of hard herb as well. Like it work really nice with rosemary or like you could use normal thyme as well. Um, 
yeah, and yeah, it, I wouldn't do it that you wouldn't be able to do it with something like parsley because it would just wilt into the oil. But we, we do like green oils in, in a different a different method. But um, yeah, they're, they're quite quite simple to do, and you can also follow that technique with garlic as well. You just put garlic cloves in and let it mm-hmm. let it slowly cook away, and it's like really nice, sort of drizzled over roasted meat, so fish, potato, stuff like that. Um, and I have another question. Sorry, I find it, okay. I find it fascinating because you say, you reel it off like it's the most simple. Like, of course, why didn't I infuse my oil in a sous vide <laughs> bath? Um, but the other question I had was, how, why um, why cook the onions in the skins? Obviously, I think most of us immediately the first thing we do when we see an onion is take the skin off. Does that help when you're? And correct me. Did, did you say you roasted them in the skins first? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what when you keep them in the skin, when you roast them, they, they steam basically in their own skin to begin with. So they go really soft and uh, delicious. And then uh, after the like some of the moisture's gone, that's when they'll start to caramelize. So um it's like a similar technique to like, you know, like black garlic, where they, they will keep the garlic in the skin and have it at a low temperature for months on end. It, it's a similar technique, but obviously done a lot quicker. So we roast the onions for a few hours. But yeah, it's, it's just keep all the flavor inside, basically. They're sort of cooking in their own juices and all the, the, the juices and that and the sugars, natural sugars from the onions start to caramelize. So it comes out really nice and sweet. Oh, brill. Um, yeah, I think you might have just changed how I make my gravy. <laughs> the, the superpower of a Michelin star chef, just those tiny tweaks. Um, I will never immediately take the skin off my my um, onion again. No, yeah, if you're roasting it whole, yeah, it's a, it's a great way to do it, keep it in the skin. Oh, brilliant. And Kath- Catherine, um, you've obviously, <laughs> I'm just looking at the um, looking at the members comments coming through. Tracy said delicious starter, beautiful texture and flavor. Chris and Richard, gorgeous starter, fantastic flavors. Nick that was insanely good. Uh, <laughs> I think it's well received. <laughs> good. Thank you very much um do you so actually I'll tell you what I'll ask questions in a moment so I feel guilty people will have tasted both together already but yeah yeah, please questions Um, so I'll tell you a bit about the wine that you will have hopefully tasted a little bit with your uh with your starter but also uh for those of you who are just tasting it now uh, along with me as well so this is um the 12th man and i'll tell you a bit about the name in a moment uh but the 12th man is a chardonnay made by wira wira from the and this particular they're not based in adelaide hills they're actually based in mclaren vale but this particular wine is from the adelaide hills so this beautiful long thin stretch um of of um it's not coastline actually in the mountain loft ranges and east of Adelaide and it does go all the way down to McLaren Vale but it's very cool climate for Australia probably one of the coolest mainland spots for Australian viticulture you know Tasmania is freezing but or cold uh but this is very cold um and because of that Chardonnay and Pinot Noir are both very popular um it's also got nice altitude so it keeps the freshness of those grapes through the diurnal range so warmer days and then very cool nights and um I believe, and I could be wrong, I believe this exact vineyard, uh, which is the, the name escapes me, Len, oh, is it Lenman? Uh, I think it's about 600 metres, but um, generally the Adelaide Hills ranges from about 150 to 750. So it's on the higher side as well. And the rainfall is quite high here. So they don't have issues with drought. They can, um, they can naturally get enough rainfall. Uh, they don't have to irrigate. Um, I'm sure it's called Lemwood. I, I've forgotten, I'll be honest, but um, it's a very famous sub-region that this particular one comes from. And Wirra Wirra is a beautiful uh, name. Its Aborigine um, translation is amongst the gum trees. And this producer was actually established in 1894 by Robert Strangways. Oh, it's Lenswood. Catherine's pipped me to it. Did I say Lenwood? I was close. Um, I'll take that. Mr. Ness. Um, so this particular producer actually started in the 18, sorry, 1894. And it, it sort of fell into disrepair. But in the 1960s, it was really made famous again by a guy called Greg Trott. And he sadly passed away in 2005. Um, but he 
bought this place in 1969 with his cousin and they sort of reinvented it and our manager from the tastings team Tim loves the name of this wine Uh, the wine is sort of named after Greg who said that he wanted to be the 12th man on the cricket team and carry the drinks so that's why it's called the 12th man And for anybody who's less familiar with Australian Chardonnay or maybe scared of Australian Chardonnay, I don't blame you. There's um, there was, I should say, a lot of bad Australian Chardonnay all around the world, um, particularly in sort of the 90s um, and well into the 2000s. But the refinement around Australian Chardonnay is unbelievable. And I think that this is really um, made in a Burgundian style. So. I'll quickly tell you how it's made and then tell me whether you like it or not, members, and Catherine too. (laughs) Um, But it's whole bunch pressed, and that's important. They put the whole bunches in. In fact, two of our wines tonight are whole bunch pressed. They put the whole bunches in, and basically the, the bunches' stalks act as channels, and only the best juice comes through. So it's called free run juice. You don't press it aggressively. You get this really lovely, light, fresh juice. And that free run juice goes into Burgundian barrels. 30% of it is new. Um, so you have a little bit of oak flavor, but not too much. And it's French oak. And um, it's wild fermented. Now, arguably, you can't taste wild ferment, but uh, a lot of people say you can. So jury out on that they do however put some into stainless steel and that's to preserve the freshness so you're not getting this big overly oaky australian chardonnay that we may have um, turned our noses up at um in the last 10 years 20 years but actually you get this lovely fresh style um and they blend the two styles back together so they blend um the, the stainless steel and then this wild ferment french burgundian barrel and it kind of adds complexity So let me quickly tell you why I paired it and then Catherine can say whether it's any good. (laughs) So I um, I wanted uh, this as soon as I tasted the dish. So the way this works is is um, Brooke kindly sends me Tom's menu in advance. I have a look through it. um, I then sort of look at sometimes ask Brooke, what would your sommelier pair? What have you considered pairing with this? Um, I also sort of look through the ingredients, but it's very hard to tell from a written menu what the quantities of ingredients are. But onion has this natural sweetness. Um, I wanted something with enough freshness because I assumed that cheese would would be adding that, um, you know, almost French onion soup, uh, cheesy top stuff. So I wanted to have enough freshness, but then also enough depth because there is quite a root vegetable flavor. Um, it's cool climate. So it mean, and it's got this free run juice. So I knew it would be a bright wine and I thought, okay, that might work. And I'd be lying if I said I hadn't tasted three or four different Chardonnays, some Chenins and some funnily enough, Pinot Gris. Um, so I had tasted the full works, but I felt like there was a bit of sweetness and, uh, somebody's mentioned the peach. Yeah. I feel like the peach and that touch of sweetness was sweet enough for the onions, but then there was this, there's this slightly earthy savory thing as well. And I think that's, what's working with those umami flavors that Tom mentioned. So, um, yeah, that's why I did it. Chardonnay is quite a natural choice for me for onion. Um, I love that, um, I love the complexity you can get from really, really well-made Chardonnay. The thing I would say is if you, if I've actually got two wines this evening that I opted away from Burgundy and I tried Burgundy with both. So I tried white Burgundy with this um, and I didn't feel like the sweetness was there on the cold vintages of the Burgundy, but also I wanted that richness and, and this just happened to be the best Chardonnay. It would work with a white Burgundy. French onion soup and white Burgundy is divine, um, but it does depend on what your quantities are. So once I try the menu and I have it in front of me and I had my multiple Chardonnays, Grenaches, Chenins and Pinot Gris and Pinot Blancs, um, the Chardonnay stood out and this particular one in, in was special. So um, I'll hand over to Catherine to see if she agrees. I do I think this is a really really great pairing and I think one of the things that really stuck out for me and I think Tom you touched on how when you've roasted the Roscoff onions for that length of time they get that little smoky um, Mm -hmm. quality to them and you're getting that flintiness in the Chardonnay as well which really balances it out and am I right in thinking that Roscoff onions that they're a little bit smaller 
aren't they? A little bit denser than perhaps the standard white onion you might be Yeah, making. they are. The, the, the kind of a cross between the large white onions and, and a shallot. Yeah, so I imagine then that really lends itself to that the the caramelising of the onion when you're roasting it. It has that bit more of a density in the sugars and it really kind of becomes lovely and rich. So yeah, you're getting yeah. that through with the wine. Um, and I think you're right, Anna, and we, we just touched on it with the, the lemon thyme. It's got that lovely citrus lift. But also throwing in the pickled onions as the other element and a different textural element as well. You know, you're needing to balance your, um, your, your acidity out, making it match in a way that you're not going to have anything really sticking out too much. Like it can be really quite tricky to pair wines with, with alliums. And we're going to see that a bit later on with one of the other courses. But it, it really hits it well. And I think a lot of that has come down to how you're cooking the, you know, the onions in this dish. Perhaps if they were in a different style, this wine wouldn't work so well because they may still have a little bit more of that vegetal quality. But um, delicious. And also the, the comte as well. You know, it's a cheese that can have the fruity element to it. Someone in the um, comments, John, has mentioned that. He is, um, he says he's slumming it, but I don't know, John. I think, you know, the fact that you've got this very Friday night dinner, I wouldn't say it's slumming it with a, a dry Prosecco. And I think the the fruitiness um, and the dry element of the Prosecco, I can see why that would really work because you are complementing the flavours that are already there. And where you've got the richness and that oil added in, you're getting a lovely sort of mouthfeel. So with the Prosecco, as you have with the Chardonnay, you're really cleansing your palate through afterwards. So I would say for, for this pairing, Anna, 10 out of 10, really good. Oh, gosh, Catherine, I wasn't expecting a 10. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got a couple of questions, if it's all right, because I think it's best to ask them whilst they're relevant, Tom, um, yep. if it's okay with you. We've, um, oh, I've got three questions, actually, all from members. Um, the first question is, uh, is actually about the whipped butter. Um, it was a question around how would you make that? Um, if you were to do it at home, you can, um, I mean, in the restaurants we use a Paco jet, but to do it at home, you can either um, do it by hand, just leave your butter to come out to soften the room temperature and then like literally just whisk it in a bowl. Um, or in a, a KitchenAid, if you have one with a whisk attachment, is a very good way to do it. Um, yeah, so let your butter sort of come to room temperature and then just yeah, whip it up, just leave it on a high heat. If you have a KitchenAid, it'll be a lot, lot easier, but it is possible with a bit of patience to do it by hand as well. I think if you do it by hand, you earn eating as much as you possibly want to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you earn your supper if you do it by hand. But yeah, um, good question. I'd like to know the answer to that. Um, then Mary Jane, going back to the um, oil and the lemon thyme, has asked what sort of oil were you using? Um, you just want a very neutral oil. Uh, so something like a, a grapeseed oil is perfect, really. Uh, because it's a, yeah, it's just neutral. It'll take on the flavour, but it's also quite. It's a it's a nicer oil to actually eat if you were to use it as a dressing or something, as opposed to vegetable or sunflower. So grapeseed would be a good one. Grapeseed, lovely. Good question. I actually hadn't um I hadn't thought of that. I'd assumed olive, but actually, of course, it's it's you want a neutral neutral backdrop, I suppose, if you're going to be infusing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then we did talk a little bit about Roscoff onions. Um, Catherine obviously mentioned them, but Stuart has asked, what is it about them that makes them in particular, that makes them so special? Um, and I'd probably like to know a, bit, a little bit more about, are they uh, UK, you know, popular in the UK? Funnily enough, I've seen them more in the supermarkets since I made this dish a few months ago. Um, but before then, they hadn't actually been on my radar, naughty me. So um, please enlighten us. Yeah, the um, I do think it's like the best sort of quality onion you can get. Really, it's like I say, it's kind of it's the big, the big sort of onions. That they're very um, harsh, very kind of uh, stringent. Um, whereas a, a, a Roscoff's got a lot more natural sugars in it, so you know they're they're even nice to eat. You can chop them up really finely and have them raw in a dressing. But like when you cook them, they're they're great. Uh, we use them in the restaurants a lot. Um, and yeah, they're kind of a, a cross between an onion and a shallot, really. So it's uh yeah they're, they're less um harsh um sort of raw and then when you cook them yeah you get a lot of natural sweetness from them and like you know you can char them um they're really beautiful there's, there's so many different ways you can cook them 
um, in the restaurant, uh, something that we do a lot is we slice them really thinly and then we cook them in a yogurt way. Mm. And uh, so you get this beautiful, so as the onions cook and the, the sugars come out, they're very sweet, but then you get the acidity from the, the yogurt way. So you get this kind of sweet and sour onion, uh, which is something we, we, we always have on at least one of the menus somewhere uh, as a garnish. Oh, that sounds delicious. Um, Sticking to the, the topic of knowing your onions, the pickled onions that were for the garnish, um, are they a shallot? And what do you pickle, what vinegar do you pickle with? Or do you not? They're, um, they're a silver skin oh, onion. And uh, we do a, quite a basic pickle for those. So it's uh, as a basic rule for pickling, we would do three parts vinegar, two parts sugar, one part water, um, boil them up pour it over and just leave them to cool so you're not you still have that crunch from them they're not they're not going completely soft you still want a bit of a uh, texture to a pickled onion i think fabulous and we're one minute off i knew we'd catch up with with uh, being behind so we're one minute off our next break but can i ask one question if you had to have one broth or soup tom what would your choice be um well, I love it. I, mean, I love all sorts of broths, especially when the nights are cold. But the onion broth is genuinely one of my favourites because of the, the sort of depth of flavour you can get. But it's also light. It's not. It's not too heavy. Uh, so I, I always prefer like a. Uh, we have a. We do. A, um, when I was on Great British Menu, I did a lamb broth as well, which was like really nice. But I, I prefer those sort of lighter consommes to a sort of creamed sort of soup. Um, yeah, just just for the lightness of it, really. Uh, yeah, the reason I asked is it's my favourite soup, broth, whatever, is onion. So when, yeah. this, when this came on the menu, I thought, ah, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, we've had one more question, but I will save it if it's all right, Sarah. Don't worry, I will bank it, Sarah and Mark. Um, just conscious if we do get behind it, things get wild. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, pop... Oh, I do apologise. I actually had a photo that I totally forgot to share with everyone, but there's a photo for you. Uh, but I'm going to pop the next slide up, which is to, oh gosh, return at 8.15 members. So I apologise, my screen seems to have frozen, but at least you can see the info. So that's returning at 8.15. Please pour the Exhibition Saint-Julien Pinot Noir. Prepare your main course, and you're also going to want to pour the Hugel Pinot Gris as well. So we'll see you in 20 minutes. Um, and it's a lovely, easy one to prepare as well. So thank you, Tom, for making it so easy for us. See you soon.
Hello again, everybody. Um, I'm just actually sending, Catherine has sent me another fabulous photo. So I'm just getting it up onto my screen. Tom, you can do the judgment of deciding whether she's plated well enough. I'll uh, <laughs> just getting it on now. I think you have done quite a good job, Catherine. To run back for cutlery, I was so laughing with my dotting of salsify puree. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, are you happy there, Tom? <laughs> yeah, it looks very good, that. <laughs> well done, Catherine. You, um, I, one thing that you've really mastered is the piping bag, because I don't know whether any other members do, have done this, but I always, always cut them either too big or too small. So I either have to really force them out or I get a sort of big splodge. So I'm proud of your piping bag size, Catherine. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. So uh, that's enough about piping bags. I'm excited to hand over to Tom. We've got sort of um, half an hour to talk about the meal, two wines and obviously the pairing. Um, but we've also got a vegetarian option um, this evening, which is the celeriac instead of the guinea hen. So um, I'm going to hand over, hopefully members are sitting down and joining us now. And I'm going to hand over to Tom to tell us all about the inspiration for this these dishes, I should say. Yeah, so um, so I'll start with the uh, guinea hen. So um, yeah, th this time of year, uh, there's you know there's not too much stuff in season. So um, sort of root vegetables, stuff like that, the salsify, the leek, stuff like that, onions, and that's what we rely on a lot uh, in the restaurants. Uh, so the guinea hen, um, it comes from Guzna, so it's about an hour away from us. Uh, we um, brine the breasts and then we make a mousse from the trimmings and that's what gets piped into it uh, so basically the meat is is um, encasing a, a mousse uh, which we then steam so it uh, obviously cooks the meat and just sets the mousse uh, so then it's ready to be caramelized afterwards um, and the legs from the guinea fowl again we uh, brine them and then we uh, cook them in the water bath uh, slowly overnight so and um, the meat sort of just falls apart we pick the meat away from the bones and then uh, that's mixed with the uh, roasted hen of the wood mushrooms and the bacon. Um, and then that's the idea of that is to go through the leeks at the last minute. So um, you have different sort of textures in there. Uh, the leeks, which will just be nice and soft. Um, the mushrooms, uh, hen of the woods, it's a, it's a beautiful mushroom. So I think it's, it's my favourite mushroom. We, we fry them um, so they go really crispy. And then uh, so they're almost like a, a dried mushroom. And then when you add them back into the leeks, they kind of rehydrate and just add a real like depth of flavour uh, to the leeks. So you've got the uh, the nice breast with the, the soft mousse in the middle, uh, the leeks with all the delicious flavours in it. And then uh, the roasted salsify, um, which we just, uh, we blanched the salsify. So it's just uh, still got a bit of bite to it. But then the idea is just to finish it in the pan, get it nice and uh, golden brown. It adds a kind of sort of nutty flavour. And then uh, the puree as well, just to add a nice texture to the dish, um, sort of unctuous texture that uh, goes really well with the guinea fowl. And then the uh, the sauce, so we make that from the bones um, of the guinea fowl. So firstly, we'll make a chicken stock from chicken thighs. We've reduced that down uh, to give us the sort of gelatin uh, that we need and the, the flavour. Then we add the roasted guinea fowl bones into that um, with a lot of uh, shallot, garlic, thyme, which we sweat it down, uh, some nice flavour. We uh, add white wine reduce that down to a glaze, then in with the brown chicken stock, uh, simmer that away. And then once it's passed, we finish it with a little bit of cream and butter, uh, just so it's nice and rich, um, really intense. And, and yeah, so that's the guinea fowl. And then, uh, like you said, the uh, celeriac, um, it's a very similar sort of dish, but we, we take the celeriacs from our farm and we uh, bake them in a salt dough. So, mm. so any vegetables, root vegetables, baked in a salt dough, it's really nice because it, again, similar to the onions really in the skin, it starts to steam uh, in its own juices because there's no way for the, the steam to escape. So it's a really nice way of cooking vegetables. You get a really intense flavour um, as opposed to obviously blanching them where you, you lose a lot of the flavour into the, the blanching water. And then uh, we've got some nice toasted pine nuts uh, to add texture into the leeks and uh, obviously like a lovely nutty flavour, rounded flavour. And then the sauce uh, we make from uh, mushroom stock. So we, we base it on a classic sort of Bordelais uh, sauce. Um, but rather than using any chicken stock or anything like that, we use mushroom mushroom stock. So you get that nice sort of depth of flavour that you would get if you use the chicken stock, but obviously completely meat free, uh, vegetarian. And it's, uh, yeah, it's just, it's just a lovely sauce for using non meat, basically. 
Amazing. Thank you. Um, I've uh, yeah, I have to say this was such a treat for me. I'm I'm a February birthday person. And uh, whenever I go to restaurants in February, you're right there. There's a bit of slim pickings on the what's in season. And so when I tasted this to pair it I thought oh my goodness I've been getting it all wrong I've been cooking the wrong cooking the wrong things in in February so it was a real pleasure to to learn a bit about what's in season um we've had a couple of questions already so I'm just going to quickly ask a couple of them before I move on to the wine because I think um one of them in particular is quite pertinent um because I'd like to know a little bit our members asked about the crumbed yeast oh uh, yeah sorry yeah Yes. Uh, yeah. So more about that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, nutritional yeast. Um, it's obviously vegetarian, vegan. Um, we just toast it, uh, like just in a pan, just to just to intensify it a little bit. It goes a little bit golden brown. Um, but it just it, again, it's like it's like a sort of umami flavor that um, it adds. It just adds a real sort of sort of meaty flavor, um, a real like intense flavor. And, and when you start to mix all of this together you know with the puree and the guinea fowl it just it's like a seasoning basically uh, similar similar sort of concept to the dashi in the onion broth um it's another way just to get that real sort of intense depth of flavor uh, it's, it's a great ingredient you know we, we use it a lot in the restaurants we make like we can add it into breadcrumbs uh, stuff like that and it, it really does make a difference and you're just frying it in a in a dry pan yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So just toasting it in a dry pan. You can do it under a grill as well if you like, but it's it's easier in a pan just because you keep it moving because it, it burns quite quickly. So you have to really keep an eye on it. Delish. Yeah. The reason I asked is because without knowing it, I think that that's one of the reasons that my first choice of wine I paired. Um, so another member had asked about it. So that's the only reason I jumped in with that one quickly. Um but I'll I'll um I'll come back to their questions if that's all right because I'm conscious if people are eating then let's yeah yeah of course talk about the uh, wines first so hopefully if you have poured your wines you've got the Pinot Gris to start um this is a wine made by Famille Hugel which is a lovely old traditional family from Alsace and um actually to be honest every time I open a bottle of Hugel I ask myself why do I not drink more of their wines lovely story such a beautiful old traditional family in fact uh, this is Rick Fia where they're based um it's romance and poetry in a bottle for me Alsatian wines they're so historic and so special and this one in particular this family the Hugels have been making wine in Rick Fia since the 1600s the same lineage of family um and Johnny Hugel late Johnny Hugel would um trying to think uh, he'd be the great uncle or the uncle yeah a few generations back but but um he was instrumental in producing or coming up with getting legalized the idea of vendage tardive and selection grand noble um wines so the sweet wines of Alsace have a lot to thank for the Hugel family um but I'm trying to think it must be his nephew Mark who is now the current winemaker and um Sadly, Etienne, uh, who was commercial director, died just a couple of years ago now, I think, um, during during the third lockdown, possibly. Um, but members may also remember during lockdown, we had Jean-Marc Hugel come and do a Zoom with us, which was fabulous. Um, and they are a wonderful family. They own about 130 hectares, but they also have um, a negotiant business. So they're very, very heavily involved. And this is their estate. Uh, Stuart's just asked, the Wine Society were the first retailer to import Hugel into the UK. Is that right? I'll take your word for it, Stuart. I assume so. Uh, if you, so it was such a loaded question. Um, it wouldn't surprise me at all. We've got such a wonderful relationship with this producer. So, yeah, it really wouldn't surprise me. Um, and I know Marcel Alford Williams, who no longer buys the Alsatian wines, um, but he has a particularly strong friendship with the Hugel family. So quite possibly. Um, so this is their estate Pinot Gris, as you can see on the screen. Um, interestingly <laughs> I'll tell you a bit well no I won't I'll tell you about why I didn't nearly didn't choose this wine in a moment but we do have two vintages so the 19's on your screen I'm actually tasting 18 but Catherine's tasting 19 um, and Tom has 19 so they're made incredibly similarly so the different parcels are selected from around Vic Rickfia um, which is actually famed for clay soils but there's a very relatively high proportion of a vineyard called um, Flotstig 
excuse my pronunciation, um, and they have these very high chalk levels for the area. So there's actually a real element of freshness for the region in this wine. Hand harvest, they keep it in steel to keep the freshness, um, but then Funnily enough, a bit like the last wine, 30% goes into old burgundy barrels. Um, but as I said, they're made in the same way. But 2018, the wine I have was much warmer. It was a much warmer vintage. So it accumulated a lot more natural sugar in the grape. So when uh, these wines, Pinot Gris loves to get sugary grapes. They're very, very unctuous, juicy grape varieties. If you pick them really early, like Pinot Grigio, you get low alcohol. But if you leave them to hang on the vine a bit longer, not Vendage Tardif sweet wines, but just longer hang time and sunshine in Alsace, uh, what you get is this lovely, rich style of Pinot Gris. Um, but you do sometimes get some residual sugar and high alcohol because that sugar is being converted to alcohol. So 2018, the warm year is, I'm horrible with numbers, but they're both labeled 14.5%. Um, so they're both 14.5%. They're actually both slightly over, but closer to 14.5 than 15. The 2018 has eight grams of residual sugar. And even though the 2019 got to the same alcohol, it's only got six and a half grams of residual sugar. And um, so that's it just compares, you know, one vintage can change one and a half grams. Don't worry, you can't taste the difference between one and a half grams of sugar uh, per liter, I assure you. I try my best in the MW studies to get it down to the exact mark. Nobody can taste one and a half grams of sugar difference, but, uh, or maybe Tom could actually, <laughs> um, but it is a little geeky thing. And the acidity of the wine. So the total acidity, tartaric acidity is different as well. So it's just the great physiology, great physiology. It's not really what I mean, but the way the grapes are grown and the slightly different years has actually made, um, a scientific difference on the wines, albeit that this wine is the opposite of science. It's made very carefully, but it's in, um, it's, or it's very lightly filtered. It's not really filtered. You might even see there's a note on the bottle, I think saying that there's, yeah, um, there might be a slight sediment because it's a sign of a not treated wine. Um, they've got a very got a sort of hands off, let nature do the talking approach though, gals. Um, so why did I pair it and why did I nearly not pair it? Um, I nearly didn't pair it because I had not put this wine in the lineup when I first received the ingredients and the, the menu. As I mentioned earlier, this was actually a wine I was planning for the first course. And um, I tasted it. And the thing about this wine is it has had a bit of age. So I've got the 18, but the 19 will be only six months younger than when I tried it Um way back in November um, when I tried mine. That age, for me, old Pinot Gris does something quite interesting and this wine in particular. And this is the reason I asked you about the yeast, Tom. There's quite a yeasty umami smell to this wine. And Pinot Grigio has all this freshness and kind of glorious white stone fruits and flowers. And that isn't here. That's intentionally not here. There's a real umami kick, savory, yeasty, earthy, um, Pinot Gris in general is good for foul dishes. Um, so goose, I think was mentioned on the notes. Um, it, it's good for rich foods. It's a white wine that deals well with rich foods, but that yeast, that umami for me in the, in the guinea fowl, and I'm sure in the pine nuts, um, et cetera, in the celeriac, I think it's fabulous with this. And that maturity, that savory edge, um, alongside a kind of yellow fruit flavor, and which matches some sweetness with the leeks, um, and the touch of residual sugar, I think is quite a nice compliment. Um, I've no idea why the sweet, the touch of residual sugar is so good. Um, Ken said the 18 Hugel works really well, like the Pinot Noir, but keep going back to the Alsace. Um, I'm glad this was this was my accident, my really happy accident, this one. Um, so I'm glad you like it, Ken. Um, first, I'll ask Catherine if you don't mind. I'll do Catherine's pairing with this and then I'll talk about the, the Pinot as well afterwards. Catherine, what do you think about this one? Oh, I hoped you weren't going to do it that way because I don't oh. know. <laughs> No, it, we'll talk about it. Um, only because I think perhaps of the two, I think the Pinot Noir is pipping it for me slightly. Okay, well, let's, I do think, let me wait. Let me yeah, wait. Let's do both. 
Okay, what do you both? I keep throwing Catherine under the bus this evening. I'm so sorry, Catherine. It's not what you want on your Friday night. Anna, changing the status quo. Um, so let's talk about the Pinot. We have got, and I always say Saint Julien with this silly French accent. It's of course not French at all. It's Chilean. Um, <laughs> so this is from a region uh, within Chile, uh, and it's part of the Limari. Um, area, should we say? I don't want to say Limeri Valley. It makes it sound like it's in the bottom of the valley floor, um, but the Limeri region, and this is Saint Julien. Still say it with a French accent. We'll leave that. We'll park that. <laughs> but it's a very famous, cool climate region, and uh, much like the Wirra Wirra wine in the Adelaide Hills, this cool area has made it very famous for two particular grape varieties, and those are Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And the soils here are also quite good, especially for those grape varieties. And they're a clay and limestone mix. And um, that's the common soil found in a lot of Burgundian wines. But the key difference here is really, um, well, there's a few other things actually similar to Burgundy. One is that this clone, the French Pinot Noir clone, the, it's called the Triple Seven. Um, it's one of the clones from Dijon, which is in Burgundy. Um, but interestingly enough, it's actually better suited for really cool climates. Not as cool as Champagne. Um, actually, it probably is good for Champagne. It's, um, it, but some of the south of Burgundy now is actually really quite warm. Whereas here in the Limery Valley, um, in Saint Julien, you are actually, this looks like the bottom of a, a valley, but this is a plateau. So you have this beautiful altitude, really great cooling influence. The thing about the Limery Valley is the channels of cold air come through between the mountain ranges and act like an air conditioner and chill the grapes down even further. So Triple um, Seven is a clone that really suits this area. And I don't, I don't think it's a coincidence that our buyer for Burgundy, Toby Morrell, is also our buyer for South America, and he chose this wine here. Um, it has got a kind of Burgundian twist to it, but of course it's still got a stamp of, of chili. And the stamp of chili for me is this really, really bright red fruit. So it's made for us by Conche y Toro and Marcello Papa is the name of the winemaker. He's absolutely wonderful. Again, Catherine, you did an event with him, didn't you, on Zoom? Yeah, he's a wonderful guy. He's a pleasure to watch. Um, but it's more the reason that um it's it's quite sunny, this wine. So it's got more black cherry than red. And that's because the sunshine has affected the skin of the grape the grapes, and the physiology has turned from what can be quite red cherry in some Pinot to black cherry. It's cold but sunny, and that's what's important. Um, they then put 25% of the grapes with the stalks on. I mentioned it with the Chardonnay earlier, but actually it's completely different when you're doing it with red wines. Um, it does all sorts of things, but one of the key things is it brings freshness and actually it can remove some color. So I don't know about you, um, mine is very pale, unbelievably pale, and actually you can get that from, from stalk leaching. Um, but it's very fruity, very, very bright fruits. And then it's aged in oak for 11 months. They are French barrels, but not that much new oak. So it's more about affecting the texture and a touch of spice, but not so overt. Um, and the reason that I mentioned that is that the, the um, Guinea hen doesn't need this big high tannic wine, but the touch of umami, touch of umami works well for me. Um, but I really like the kind of fruit forward nature. And for me, this is less about the, the pairing being, um, you know, yeasty and yeasty, like the first one was. This is more about a structural pairing for me. So it's got a bit of tannin and a bit of grip, but it's very fresh and the acidity cuts through the richness of the dish. Um, so that lightness of touch that you get from a whole bunch of Pinot Noir, I think is, is evident. Um, and I did try with some other, I said I was going to mention the Burgundies again, I tried with some Burgundian much meatier and more mushroomy Pinots, but they were too meaty that sometimes the mushroom is quite nice with mushroom, but actually, you know, then you sort of move into this slightly overpowering world. Um, so for me, it needed a, a light touch Pinot and this was it. So there we go. I've pitched, I've pitched them both to you, Catherine, you've already revealed which one. <laughs> I know, I'm showing my colours. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, so 
I'll come on to why I think the Pinot Noir for me is the preferred out of the two. But when I first saw what your, you know, the wine selection was and saw what the menu was, I thought I was going to be absolutely bang on with the Pinot Gris and that that would be the wine to pair. And it does pair really, really well. And I think if this was the only wine that you'd paired, I would be like, absolutely. It works beautifully. You've got that really lovely yellow orchard fruit that we were talking about, the freshness but also the umami as well, which pairs beautifully with everything on the plate. But for me, I think it's the, the contrast and the structure of the Pinot Noir that is just pipping it as a, um, as a pairing. I think where you've got that lovely plush black fruit from the sunshine, but you also have a slight crunchy element in the stalks and the fact that you've got the, the cooler um, climate coming through as well it really balances nicely. And I think as well with guinea hen and guinea fowl in general, having that touch of gamey character to it, it is that bit richer and a little bit more going on for it than the um, than your lighter sort of poultry, your, your, your fowl, your chickens and things. And the fact that we've got it with um, the comfy element as well, it really adds it in. Also, I don't know, Anna, if it's, um, it has had any um, MLF to it, any malolactic fermentation to it, but it tastes a little bit of a creamy note to me. That might be slightly from picking up from the old oak and a bit of the, the textural element to it, but that's really going quite nicely with the, the salsa, the, the, the puree creaminess to it in the Pinot, yeah, in the Pinot Noir, which I think really, really works really nicely for me. Um, and the final thing is that it is that little bit lower in alcohol. And I'm finding that the yeah. Pinot yeah. Gris, I'm feeling the alcohol more in the Pinot Gris and it's a little bit out of whack. So I have the 19 and maybe it will, you know, soften out a little bit if we left it for some time, but it feels slightly out of whack with the, the rest of the dish being so sort of riching and comforting that um, for me, the Pinot Noir is just, just a little bit more... You, we've got Catherine's vote for the Pinot Noir. We've got another vote, Stuart said, that it matches the sauce really well. I think that's a really good point. Matching sauces is often a cheat's way for me of food and wine pairing. Um, structure, et cetera, always really important. But at the end of the day, sometimes it's that sauce that you, you're you mopping up at the end. <laughs> and uh, also delicious sauces, not wasting a drop. So glad cameras aren't on. Um, but yes. So thank you. Thank you um, for your comments. Please do write what you preferred. Um, now I've got lots more. <laughs> we've had, uh, oh, look, we've got Pinot. some people coming in for Pinot Gris as well. There we go. We've got an even balance now. I'm pleased. Um, before I go on to questions as well, Tom, I've had a lovely comment I thought I'd um, that I'd share with you. Uh, Tracy has said, as a veggie, please may I applaud the Rogan home people for giving us delicious, tasty food rather than tick box. And she said that you've given me happy moments during lockdowns in particular when I needed a hug of food and good food and wine. Well, oh, thank you very much. That's uh, very kind of you. Do you, um, that leads me on to a question of my own before I go on to members' questions. When you're coming up with um, vegetarian alternatives or vegetarian options, I should say, rather than alternatives, are you um, trying to match similar characters? Um, and are there any sort of hints and tips I felt like yeast was actually a great one that's a lovely umami flavor that's quite um out of the box should we say are there any top ideas for bringing depth of flavor to vegetarian dishes um yeah I mean with regards to bringing uh depth yeah things like yeast flakes and uh, mushrooms especially uh, dried mushrooms and also seaweeds different varieties of seaweed so uh kombu is a really good one um kelp stuff like that into stocks um really does add like a real depth of flavor into into things and um yeah just those those sort of um those sort of like things in stocks or sauces um say so like we make we make our sort of version of a meat sauce using mushroom um mushroom juice uh like steamed mushrooms and then you we blend them and hang them so all the, the natural juices come out mm. um and then, you know, with regards to like cooking vegetables, we do a lot of salt baking, we do a lot of barbecuing. Um, and again, we try and treat like the vegetables, like we will cook them as we would cook a piece of meat. It's very rare that we'll actually blanch 
vegetables other than like green vegetables, things like asparagus and stuff. Um, but yeah, also like yeah, making sauces from different like you can grill celeriac for example and then juice it and you get like a smoky stock which mm. then add butter and a bit of cream into it makes a, a really delicious sauce but uh, yeah like I say like sort of blanching root vegetables was things we would never really do because you lose a lot of the flavor to the water um so yeah cooking in salt baking or barbecuing or even just roasting like jet like a, a carrot just roasted in butter just gently over like a low heat is, is absolutely delicious mm. oh um, I know Catherine eats a lot of, of, I mean, we both do actually, to be fair, we we try and eat um, a decent amount of, of vegetables and vegetarian food, but yeah, the Rogan boxes are inspired. So thank you. Um, on that point, I have a question about salsa fee. Uh, let me find it. A uh, member has asked, I've never heard of salsa, I've never had, sorry, salsa fee before, seen it in Sainsbury's, but never knew what how to do with it. Sorry, how to cook it or what to do with it. Suggestions welcome. Yeah, so uh, salsa fee uh, is very similar to an artichoke. Um, so uh, first thing to sort of know about it is uh, it will oxidise incredibly quickly. Once you've peeled it, if you leave it on the bench, a couple of minutes it'll start to go brown. So always clean it really well, peel it, but always have um, some acidulated water. So a good squeeze of lemon juice into some water and then as, as soon as you've peeled it, drop it into uh, drop it into the water to stop it from oxidizing and then uh, there's a couple of ways you can cook it you can either um, you can just blanch it and then roast it afterwards um, or you can cook it um, as you'd say like allegrex so kind of pickled um, so with some uh, either olive oil or rapeseed oil uh, obviously in the restaurant we use rapeseed oil uh, some vinegar some shallots and garlic in there and, and bring it all up and just simmer it so the they're kind of pickling as they're cooking and then uh Roast them in a pan, uh, it's really nice, or you can uh, gratinate them. So, like, once they've been blanched, you can put, like, a cheese sauce over the top and bake it in the oven. It's really delicious. Um, they also make, I mean, they're quite fiddly, but you can you can actually keep the skin on, clean it really well, slice them thinly and deep fry them. And they add, come up with a nice little crisp, which should add nice texture to, to a dish. We've done it before, like, a big pile of them, because they, they shrink up quite a lot, so they're really small, they look quite cool. Uh, put it over the top of some fish or something for a nice texture lovely oh delicious um I, I will hold my hands up I've never cooked with it Catherine have you I, bet I mean you. I think from my attempt of pronouncing it early on it's <laughs> the first time I've seen, seen it but um but I'm gonna hunt it out now because I really enjoyed it it's um it is one of those things probably people just don't have the confidence and don't know what to do with it so. yeah exactly and it sort of lends itself to like nutty flavors as well so you can make like a dressing from like again blanch it and then make like just a nice simple dressing from like some roasted nuts some some cheese a little bit of oil frizzle it over the top yeah it's lovely is it mm. is it native to the uk is it um or is it like a something that yeah yeah it could be yeah, grown in the uk yeah Amazing. Ah, oh, Ken says also very common in Germany called black root. Um, I've, you've inspired me. That's my next on my shopping list. So thank you. Um, we've got a couple more questions. So one is um, about the yeast again. I think the yeast is a big hit. Ken and Andrea have got a little bit left over. What what else would you do with it? Um. So. Well, we use it um, so you can put it. One of my favorite things to do with it. Uh, is mix it with some breadcrumb. Uh, if if you really want to be, uh, we bake chicken skin, so mm -hmm. it goes really crispy. Chop that up, mix it with the yeast flakes, and then over the top of some like mashed potato or mm -hmm. you know something like that. It's one of my favourite things. We used to uh, when I used to we used to have a mashed potato on at Rogan and Co. And then at the end we'd make it fresh each service. So at the end of every day, whatever was left, I'd normally have that with some yeast flakes and chicken skin on top and a, a bit of sauce off one of the dishes but it's delicious not very good for my uh waistline <laughs> but it was yeah very nice so uh, yeah so it's just yeah just bring it over the top of like some mashed potato or over the top of some meat or fish anything really it just brings out the flavors of anything Sounds like the most elevated mashed potato I've ever heard. <laughs> um, delicious. So I've got a couple of questions that are less about these dishes, but I think it'd be really lovely to ask them now whilst we're enjoying a couple of glasses of wine. Um, so we did have the Sarah and Mark question from earlier, which was, um, as an executive chef, do you still do nightly services in your re in the restaurants? 
Yeah, yeah, I do. I'm um, I'm I'm always in one of the restaurants. Um, I did lunch service today at Long Clume. I was at Long Clume last night. Um, I'm I normally go where I'm most needed. So if one of the head chefs is off, I might spend the whole week at the restaurant. If they're all on, I'll I'll split my time evenly and just go in and really offering support to the head chefs and making sure they're all all right and making sure everything's sort of as it should be. But yeah, service is my favorite favorite thing. That and obviously creating the dishes, but. I'm not one to really sit at a computer. I've got a very short attention span. I, my mind wanders. I, I don't. I don't particularly enjoy it very much. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm like doing service is my favorite. My favorite thing, really. I know. I always feel bad whenever we have any chef on here. I always feel bad because I know that they would rather be in a warm kitchen. No, this is nice. <laughs> no, you're not. The like, I like doing service for the reason of like getting to see what the customers think, and you know, and it, it all sort of like I, I love. The creative aspect of coming up with a dish but then also when you see like a dish that you've worked on for a long time and then it's finally being served to people and you see they're enjoying it that's that's like the best part of the job for me really amazing um so this is i might what i might do is actually this is quite a good little moment to do the q a and then it means that if you want to rush off to service you can as well tom so <laughs> um i've got a, a really great question actually from from uh stuart who said when simon did uh wine so we had simon rogan on gosh i can't remember a year maybe a year ago now and he um said that lemon was lemons as in not lemon time lemon was the one ingredient that he missed given yep. that he was trying to do local what is the one ingredient that you can't use but would love to I suppose particularly for long plume because that's quite strict rules that you have am I right yeah yeah we do yeah um <laughs> a good question I don't it's a great question yeah um I mean yeah lemons and citrus is it is because it's such a good way to bring out the flavors in sauces and stuff and we've, we've really had to sort of work on that over the years and trying to find ways to 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 get the same um the same like know, like to get the same results as, as using a lemon so you know we ferment a lot of things but yeah i, I would probably say that as well because also you don't get like that i love using citrus zest in things and ways of seasoning and stuff so yeah yeah i'll probably say the same as simon to be honest lemons lime citrus yeah nice i suppose um yeah well well maybe one maybe one day um but you try and make it even quite close regionally don't you where you can so i can't imagine cumbria is is no exactly i think we've we had a lot of courgettes this year um on the farm and we we fermented them and then uh took the juice and i think that's probably the closest we've come since i've been here to actually replicating something with a similar acidity to lemon juice so interesting i'm quite happy about that hmm what a good trick um so i've got one more question before we so we're going to break members at um 8 50 to let everybody go and cook their puddings but i've got a great question again from tracy um who it's a great british menu question i hope you don't mind um uh, who says there's been a lot of Twitter discussion about chefs the last couple of weeks. I've been watching it actually vividly this year. Um, but uh, Tracy's interested to know how the chefs get chosen or approached and how do you go about building your menu? Um, I'm not, well, I mean, as far as the chefs are chosen, I, I don't know. <laughs> you'd, have, you'd have to That's ask awesome. the producers, I think. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I personally, uh, I got an email just, yeah uh, oh no sorry uh, somebody rung me they got they rung the restaurant got my number and um it was one of the, the team from the show asking would i be interested um so i said yeah and then uh i had to wait obviously to find out what the brief was and then once i found it just just some research really if i found at first uh i struggled with it a little bit but then i sort of something clicked and and i think it's helped me a lot now in just in my career in general to maybe think outside the box a little bit when coming up with dishes and the sort of endless possibilities rather than you have to forget a little bit of what you've sort of mm. been taught and trained and yeah think think a little bit more creatively um but once yeah once I started to get the ideas together I enjoyed it I was very nervous um very <laughs> yeah it was it was quite uh it was a lot to take like being in studio cameras in your face and stuff like that but yeah, I, I did enjoy it and 
you know, the, the people who I met on the show, who work on the show were great and I, I stay in touch with a lot of them now. So yeah, it was good. It was good fun. Oh, that's good to hear. Um, lovely. So that's perfectly. It's as if you're in showbiz now, Tom. Perfectly. <laughs> exactly the moment that was required. Uh, so we're going to send off members and they've only got 10 minutes, but it's a lovely, simple uh so lovely, simple dessert. So I'm going to pop the uh, slide up. You've got 10 minutes to create your final course. Now we sound like the um, Great British Menu. So if you could please return at nine o'clock, members, and bring your banyuls as well. So prepare your dessert and bring your banyuls. And then any other outstanding questions we'll obviously ask after we've had our pitch. So cheers and see you in a moment.
Wonderful stuff. Uh, yes, I'm very excited for this course. Um, I don't even have that much of a sweet tooth. And I thought that this was absolutely divine. So um, I'm excited. I think Catherine might still be preparing. Oh, here she is. I haven't had a photograph of your course, Catherine. Can you show me? <laughs> she's putting the final touches on. Ah, oh, she sent it. Wonderful. I'm going to send it to myself and I'll pop it on the screen in a moment. Um, thank you very much, Catherine, for being our guinea pig this evening. I'm glad that you did manage to get everything done on time. I do thank appreciate you for it. having me. You should see the state of my kitchen, but it's been <laughs> delightful. Members, I'm sure um, I'm, I'm sure not all of you's kitchens will be as bad, but I know that when I've done these events, the washing up often waits until the morning. Sometimes that just needs to happen on an evening like tonight. Um, I'm going to share Catherine's picture now. Lovely, Catherine. There you go. It's looking very fancy. <laughs> So, Tom, I'm going to hand over to you to uh, talk about this lovely dish. Yep. So, um, so this uh, dessert is uh, based around the uh, blackberries that we uh, that we get and uh, we preserve. Um, again, this time of year, we're very very limited on what we have, so the restaurant really sort of relies on what we can uh, harvest in the summer months and preserve. So. Um, in the container, there's a cream which has been set with some uh, caramelized white chocolate. So uh, we take the white chocolate, we steam it um, overnight. And uh, so, so by the time you come back the next morning, it's it's gone brown, kind of like that sort of classic chocolate bar, the caramac, that's that, that color, that kind of flavor, um, which sort of takes some of the sweetness out of it. Um, obviously, as you it's caramelizing and gets a sort of bitter note. So, yeah, so the cream's uh, set with that. We, we bring the cream to the bowl, emulsify in the chocolate, and then obviously as it cools down, it sets kind of like a panna cotta uh, style texture, uh, but a little bit richer. Um, the blackberries, we uh, when they're in season, we harvest them, we, we macerate them with some sugar, um, and then we steam them. So the sugar draws out a lot of the, the juices from the blackberries. So then we strain that off. We vat pat the blackberries down and the sort of residual sugar left in them is enough to preserve them uh, in the fridge for as long as we need. And then with the juice that comes out from the blackberries, we set that in a gel uh, using uh, a seaweed base called agar agar. So we uh, we boil it up, we set it and then we blend it. So it comes out like a puree basically, but it's, it's got all the delicious flavors from the blackberries. And then um, we're serving that with just a very simple sponge uh, that we bake just to be warmed through. So it adds a bit of sort of body as well to the dish and a different texture. And then uh, of course the toasted almonds for a bit of crunch and uh, finished with the um, oxalis, which is from our farm, which is like a variety of sorrel. Uh, so it's a little bit acidic um, and it just sort of finishes the dish off nicely. Amazing. What I love about this dish in particular, and like I mentioned at the beginning, I'm not the sweetest of two tooths, but what I love about this is on paper, it was sort of, I think it's described as white chocolate berries and almonds or something. And it sounds so simple. And then hearing you explain the love and care that's gone into making basically a dessert that has had it been in a time machine, you know, with all these beautiful fresh fruits from months ago that you've then, um, yeah, preserved so wonderfully that you can then transport it into this, this dessert now. So yeah, it blew my mind. Tracy said, I absolutely love this dessert. So you've got another huge fan there. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, I just, it's it's one of those things. Um, so on, on the on paper point, when I first received the menu and saw white chocolate, I went, oh no, it's such a scary thing to pair with wine. It usually is so, so sweet, like you said. So funnily enough, this is another accidental pairing. I just read it, um, so I was sort of working off, gosh, this could be, you know, this could be a, a sort of sticky, sweet. Uh, so I got some very, very sweet high residual sugar wines in to try. And actually, they were all too sweet for this because it has got that lovely freshness. And like you've mentioned, I mean, I had no idea why the white chocolate didn't taste so sweet. And you've just explained to me, Tom, um, with that incredible process of, of kind of, yeah, car car would you call it caramelizing it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I was sort of tested on this one. And actually, in the end, 
this was on my shelf. I'll show members the sliders, but better. But um, the uh, this wine was on my on my wine rack. It wasn't even a wine that I'd bought in to try. Um, because here it says go with chocolate. It doesn't mean white chocolate, believe me. Marcel Alford Williams, who buys this wine, has it with sort of 80% cocoa. And so this hadn't even been on my radar of wines that I should possibly try. Um, but, 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 I think that uh, <laughs> somebody said crazy, it almost makes the banyols a palate cleanser. They work so well together. I honestly just picked up this wine out of the rack and I thought, oh, I'll give it a go. I didn't even try it chilled when I first tried it. And then I put it in the fridge and thought, oh, my goodness, that actually might work. Um, but it's because that that there's only about 80 grams of residual sugar in this wine. And that sounds like a lot. Um, but believe me, in the world of sweet wines, it really isn't. You know, you won't find any so turn that low. Um, you're looking at more like 130 grams up. Uh, you certainly won't find your sort of five Putinos, tok eyes, et cetera, et cetera. So you just, you know, there's, there are certain wines in the world that have under 10 grams residual sugar and very few of them are red fruited. Um, so I was lucky that I happened to love this style of wine. Um, so it comes from the south of France. It comes from the Roussillon region in particular. The subregion is Banyuls and it's in the foothills of the Pyrenees Mountains. Um, hard work this is actually sorry it's not very high resolution but this is a photo from the producers the passe family uh domaine de la rectory they'd farmed this area for a long time it is backbreaking work you can see they're using a horse and plow the fields are so undulating you can see the coast as well you can see the seaside in the back of the picture um it is literally um you know, oh, right by the coast and over the border to Spain. And this particular family used to sell all of their wines to a um, to a co-op for a long time. But in the 40s, no, sorry, not in the 40s, 80s again, two, the two brothers came back, quite a similar story to earlier, um, Mark and Thierry, and um, they decided to start making their own wine properly. And it's famous for these steep slopes. It is not for the faint-hearted making wine in Banyuls. Uh, it's very, very difficult. And these particular these particular producers have very old vines as well. So they're resilient, um, but the, and they plant them very close together to make sure that they're even more resilient. But actually um, it does mean that, that they don't get a huge amount of fruit from them. They do make white and red wine as well, um, but Banyuls itself must be what's called a VDN, which is a vin du naturel. And that means it's essentially like a fortified red wine. Um, it, if nobody's tried it before, I would call this a light, a light port. Um, it's a lighter alcohol, obviously. I think it's 17 and a half. Yeah, 17 and a half percent. What they do to make this wine is they take um, Grenache Noir, 90 percent and 10 percent Carignan of these really old vines around 50 years old. And then during the fermentation, they um, so as the the yeast here, um, uh, a different kind of yeast, not a necessarily tasty yeast. This is the yeast that converts the sugar to alcohol, um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, and that yeast, halfway through the fermentation process, there's a little bit of sugar left and a little bit of alcohol. Well, there's a lot of sugar, 80 grams of sugar left. And when it's at quite a low alcohol point, they then stick a load of fortify, uh, stick a load of um, spirit in, they fortify it i.e. make it 17.5%, the yeast can't work anymore, they die out, and they leave the natural sweetness of the grapes. And I think that's what's really nice about this wine. It's not, it, it, Van du Naturel is quite nice, they're unpretentious, because this is basically like alcoholic grape juice, <laughs> um, is probably the way to describe it. The Grenache um, element, for me, is what makes it a really good pairing. Um, it's Lots of sort of currants, berries, blackberries, red berries, raspberries. Um, and so really, this is a, an example of I've I almost ignored the chocolate element without being too mean, Tom. But those berries were so delicious that I really wanted to make them shine. And I felt like this was the right wine to do it with. Yeah. They were amazing. They are amazing. Catherine, how do you feel about the berries? <laughs> it's delicious. delicious. I will say. I've um, sort of other than the twelfth man, I've coravaned everything this evening. But I think when we finish, I may have to actually open the banyuls properly um, and enjoy a proper glass. And I've been very restrained in 
enjoying the rest of the pudding because I think it, it deserves having a decent amount to go with it. But yeah, I agree. I mean, when you read it as chocolate, you expect something so different to how it tastes. And that yeah. caramelized flavor is just so delicious. And I love a toasted almond. They are my mum's go-to topping for a trifle. So <laughs> we, you know, they're an annual occurrence in our Christmas menu. Um, but they just add such a lovely um, toasty nuttiness that is is mild but full of flavour at the same time, if that makes sense. Um, and the the blackberries are just so fresh but rich. I think really, really delicious. I really enjoyed this pairing. Good. I'm pleased. It was, yeah, it was the one that I went, oh no, I, I had, like I said, bought lots of other things and then went, oh, and somebody's asked, would a vivre work? Um, I tried a sweet Shannon and it didn't work, sadly. The th- point I suppose is that the the berries are so full of flavour. Tom's done such a perfect job of preserving them and making them sing that you want something red. And that's the challenge. Um, a lot of sweet wines are made from white grapes. And there are, you know, um, John's mentioned that he has had it with a 20 year old tawny. The the key difference of a tawny port and this wine is that um, to tell you what they do after they fortify it, they keep the skins on. Oh, I've managed to get some cork in mine. Um, They keep the skins macerating. So you get this lovely, rich color, but they fill casks only for eight months and they top them right to the top and um those casks i suspect are probably even stainless steel they're really trying to keep freshness tartness that kind of bitter kick um and so i think the um a tawny port the difference with a tawny is it's oxidized so the barrels have allowed oxygen in and those fruits are no longer very fresh even a 10 year old tawny will start to be a little bit more of that kind of degraded fruit flavor which is still delicious don't get me wrong drink tawny port forever but i think um for me it was that kind of fresh tart there's almost a bitterness to a good blackberry as well and i think there is a bitterness in this wine which um, is that lovely kind of, yeah, battle constantly between sweet and tart. Um, So (laughs) uh, somebody's mentioned my nails. I apologise because two of them aren't painted. So I'm really embarrassed. (laughs) I I like to move my hands around. So I'm very sorry. I was spotted earlier. I'm just ashamed. Um, Luther has said the red sweet wine works really well because there's so much red fruit flavor in the dessert that it needs a sharp red wine to go with it. Um, Yeah, I think that's probably summed up better than I could what I was getting at. Um, So I'm I'm conscious of Tom's time more than anything. So I've got a couple of questions for you, Tom, if it's all right, but we won't. Yeah, that's that's fine. Um, And then members, I do have a um, I do have a poll. So I tell you what, I'm going to put the poll on now whilst we ask Tom some questions and then you can fill it in at your leisure. Uh, The poll is very simple. It is which wines would you uh, which wines would you just changing it to multiple choice? Which wine and food pairing or course pairings this evening did you like? And I have switched it to multiple choice. I know lots of you are are disagreeing in. in your homes so I've put the four wines I didn't put the champagne on there because hopefully there's a more interesting pairing than than the aperitif (laughs) but (laughs) but I will ask a few questions um so we've had a question I love this question which ingredient do you feel doesn't get enough love Uh, it would be really interesting to know the ingredients on the top chef's radars that most home cooks don't always think about um well, I think that, well, we mentioned stuff like yeast flakes and that is stuff that I don't think everybody knows about, but like, you know, when they do find out, then, you know, so I, I feel stuff like that is, is uh, I've been asked that question before and I've, I've actually said yeast flakes. Um, I mean, British ingredients, I don't know if it's underrated, but like, I think, you know, asparagus and peas and stuff like that, the, the stuff we grow in, in Britain in the spring um, is you know the best in the world and like, I, I personally just get really excited when that time of year comes in and peas asparagus broad beans all those sort of things start to come in yeah I think I I love a humble pea one yeah. of the most delicious one of the most delicious foods um uh, good answer um also we have had a couple of people ask so I'll just say now um 
the uh, are the breakfast buns for breakfast or are they now tom i had to ask other tom this question because i wasn't sure myself uh when they first were delivered they are for breakfast right yeah for breakfast yeah well that's the idea if you want to eat them now feel free but yeah the, <laughs> the idea behind putting them in the boxes would be something for the next morning yeah it was a lovely touch so um the team at simon rogan thought they would give us a little treat which was all a little saturday morning breakfast bun so obviously if you um if you want to, you're welcome to eat it now, as as Tom said. Um, could you maybe just tell us a little bit about the breakfast ban? I completely forgot about it. Yeah, that. of course. So it's uh, this was Danny, um, our head chef who does the the boxes. Uh, this was his idea. So it was a chase uh, take on a Chelsea bun, but it's it's Danny's Cartmel bun. Uh, so in the mix is some uh, brandy, some raisins, and then uh, just using uh, again some preserved stuff from our farm. So the glaze has been. Uh, flavoured with uh, elderflower and then there's a little meadow sweet powder uh, so meadow sweet is actually it's grow it grows wild um around cumbria so in the season we have you know normally five or six chefs out every day collecting bags of it and then we we dry it in the in the oven um so we've got it for the whole year because it, it's a flavor that is quite vanilla -y. um and again it's great great substitute for vanilla which we can't use at the restaurant so like we, we go through a lot of it so like yeah we'll be literally out collecting bin bags full of it and then drying it down and blending it to a powder so that's that's to go on top amazing one member's asked is it for the hangover i think those flavors worthy of more than a hangover i'd wait till yeah. you <laughs> until you taste that um my question would also be how you must have uh, you mentioned blending it down into a powder but you do you do preserve so much at the restaurants do you have quite a decent amount of space to be able to do that yeah so just recently um liam who has worked with the company for for years he's, he's worked at long Clume, he was the head chef at rogan and co and, and now his new role uh, is purely preserving so him along with um he normally will take a couple of our apprentices so we can teach them. But yeah, we have we, we have a space uh, dedicated just for all the preserves, pickles, everything. So it's a full time job because um, obviously he's got to supply free restaurants up here. We use them in the boxes as well. And then also uh, our list, which is our restaurant in London. Uh, so, yeah, constant supply. So, yeah, you know, we the idea is by the end of the summer, we've got a massive walk-in fridge full of everything and then Hopefully by the time the spring starts coming around, we've used all that throughout the autumn and winter and then we start the process again. Oh, um, but it actually leads me on to another sort of uh, question around what do you use in the winter months instead of tomatoes and cucumbers, especially considering things like the current shortages? What can what can people be swapping out if their regular staples aren't available at the moment? You wouldn't use it anyway. It's not in season. But what, what advice would you give to people? Yeah. Um, well, uh, we again, we kind of rely on the preserves that we that we we do, you know. So tomatoes, again, we we dry them in the oven and then back pat them down with rapeseed oil. So we have them right throughout the winter. Uh, cucumbers, we ferment them, um, so they, they have like a pickle pickle flavor to them. But yeah, so we have that's what that's that's what we rely on in the restaurants, you know. We have to because we won't buy anything that's not in season or it's not British, so we do have it's very much that sort of nordic style um which is part of the reason i went to copenhagen i wanted to learn more about that but you know because the winters are so harsh they have to rely on a lot of preserves and pickles so that's what we do um that's all we can do because <laughs> if we didn't we wouldn't have much to use fair enough i think it's a good lesson for all of us um you know and um, particularly growing things at home and looking at i i grew far too many radishes in the first lockdown but we pickled them and they were the most amazing things to have in salads. Yeah. Uh, they were great. Uh, we did have a question earlier that I've I've lost. And Catherine, you might be able to help me out. There was a couple from Glasgow who were asking your advice. And I'm going to try and find it now. There's a couple from Glasgow asking advice on um, what they... Here we go. Tom, what would you grow if you had a small space outside? We're thinking certain like specific herbs or salad leaves that you think are really good if you've got a small space and then just beware they are in Glasgow. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, um, I mean, herbs, it's it, it's normally all the, the hard herbs of so rosemary, uh, thyme, stuff like that. It's good to grow outdoors. Uh, in the summer, tomato plants are really great to, to put out there. Um, 
broad beans. I find the, you know, I don't do a lot of growing, but my girlfriend, is, she has like tomato plants and broad beans and stuff. And then in the winter, potatoes, beetroots, carrots, um, those are the sort of things that I think are great. And, you know, stuff that, stuff that you use a lot, you know, and it, it does make such a difference. Like stuff I've learned from Simon over the years of like the, the difference of buying something from a supermarket to, you know, pick, picking it out of the ground and cooking it the same day or within a couple of days. And then there's kind of the reason as well, going back to before about the vegetarian food, a lot of it, it does just come down to the quality of the vegetable itself. So, yeah, I would I would advise those sort of things like tomatoes are, are amazing in the summer when you, you pick them fresh off and just have them dressed in a little salad. And like gem lettuce and things like that, quite relatively easy to grow as well. So, Yeah, and a good gem lettuce is a different league to a bad one. Absolutely, yeah. And again, you don't just have to eat them raw. You know, we grill them in the restaurant. We uh, we cook them on the barbecue. They're amazing, like cooked as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to do is quickly uh, just reveal the pairings. I don't know whether this is. I never quite. I always feel like we should have two questions. One which was your favourite course, and then one which was your favourite pairing. But I'll share the results. So. Everything had votes, absolutely everything. Just winning was the Pinot Gris. Um, and then the Wirra Wirra Chardonnay and the Banyols at the end came in second, um, but really only by a couple of points ahead of the Pinot Noir. So we had a bit a bit of a vote for everything, which is delightful. So um, yeah, I think that's testament to your delicious menu um, more than my wine pairings. Honestly, it was a pleasure to pair them. So. <laughs> I can't I can't say that um it was hard work and Catherine have you had a hard work kind of evening tonight oh I've had a lovely evening thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> no I mean it's um thank you Tom and Anna it's it's really it's been a lovely way to end the week and it's just so nice to I feel a lot of the, the courses and just the, the whole Simon Rogan ethos and you know we were touching on it and the pickling and using things in season it's really going back to the way that we should be approaching food, the best, you know, the best way to get the best out of it. Um, and I felt that there's quite a lot of sort of forage-esque elements to creating the menus and choosing what ingredients to use. And I, I really sort of appreciate that because it's definitely something that I am more interested in and for my own kind of way of cooking. And Anna saying, you know, very much wanting to be a little bit more veg focused and um a bit less on on the meat as the go-to so um I mean I'm definitely going to go and hunt that down some salsa bee um <laughs> to see if my local green growth has some um or if not if you can tell me where to find some because I I really sort of appreciate being able to try these sort of um ingredients that we don't have as easy access to just in your general supermarket so thank you very much no problem at all I'm glad you enjoyed it it was absolutely wonderful. So, yeah, seconding Catherine's thanks, Tom. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you as well to Brooke behind the scenes and to Thomas for helping us all pull everything together for tonight. Um, you know, glitch free, an absolute heavenly guest to have talk. You talk so passionately about the ingredients. So it really has been lovely. And you only have to see from the comments coming through uh, my... <laughs> <laughs> I think Sandra has summed it up. Although our presentation skills were not Michelin quality, the food was delicious. And I'm always in awe of how you managed to produce such incredible meal kits. Um, honestly, Home by Simon Rogan and the, the work that you and the team do is just amazing to be able to deliver that to people's doors. So long may you continue. Um, and I'm going to be handing over the baton to Catherine, who will be organising these events in the future. So she's better at talking about food and wine than me anyway. So that's great. Um, so we hope that one day you'll come back and talk to the Wine Society again, Tom. Um, and either way, I'm sure all of us will keep eating your delicious meal kits. So thank you very, very, very much. No problem at all. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Cheers. Nice thank one. you. Everyone.